Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the guest speaker of the day, Dr. A.J. Thomas, who is a well-known poet and a translator. Born in Kerala, 1952, Dr. Thomas has over 20 books to his credit. He has been associated with uh, Sahitya Academy in various capacities and has served as the editor of uh, world famous Indian literature, the Journal of uh, Academy for several years. He has received his uh, MPhil and PhD research degrees in English with specialization in translation studies. Dr. Thomas has taught English in Benghazi University, Aj Dabia branch, Libya from 2008 to 2014. He has also been associated with Indira Gandhi National Open University as a senior consultant. And uh, as a translator, he has uh, engaged with the works of uh, highly illustrious writers, including O. N. V. Kuru, Paul Zakaria, and M. Mukundan. And he has edited the books of uh, uh, U. R. Anand Murthy. Dr. Thomas is an editor of the best uh, Indian literature that comprises 2,500 2,500 pages of four volumes published by Sahitya Academy. Dr. Thomas is a recipient of Katha Award, AKMG Prize 1997, and Vodafone Crossword Award 2007. He is a holder of Senior Fellowship, Department of Culture, Government of India, and he is an honorary fellow of the Department of Culture, Government of South Korea. He has also represented India at various academic events organized in countries like South Korea, Australia, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Nepal. Most importantly, Dr. Thomas is a wonderful person. He accepted our request for delivering the inaugural lecture at a very short notice and over a simple phone call. It was his kindness that despite being it being a short notice, despite the compulsion of virtual platform, and despite not knowing us personally, he consented to deliver today's talk. Maybe it is for the love of literature, maybe it's for the love of translation. As he has told me that he has uh, the content which will run longer than an hour, I resist the temptation to introduce anything further and allow the participants to listen to him directly. Over to you, sir, please. Yeah. It's been my pleasure to address you all. Good afternoon to you all. Greetings to all those who are listening to me. Greetings also to my friends, Professor P.P. P. Giri, sir, Udaya Narayana Singh and K.M. Sharif, who are going to speak subsequently on different days in the workshop. Professor P.P. P. Giri, sir, is, uh, incidentally, the, he was a member of my uh, uh, PhD Viva committee, and he was one of the, the scholars who awarded me the degree. So I personally uh, am obliged to him. And uh, Professor Uday Narayana Singh is very close to me from the very uh, early years of my tenure in Sahitya Academy from 1997. He was one of the first uh, poets whom I got acquainted with. And he, when he was director of uh, CIIL, invited me to join the language committee and uh, for Malayalam, and I joined. And only uh, because I have to go to Libya, I had to after two years, I had to break off, but I have fond memories of uh, uh, visiting my school, living there in the uh, guest house, and uh, engaging in uh, deliberations of the committee. So I personally thank him for all those uh, uh, great things that happened. And K.M. Sharif is a, uh, a friend again in translation. We are comrades with Adams in several workshops. And we, have met, uh, we haven't met. Uh, Recently, in time, but we have uh, sweet memories of uh, working together. I also greet Dr. Mesh Kumar, who has contributed impressive essays, translations, and book reviews to Indian literature when I was its editor. I also greet the other eminent scholars who are going to speak on the coming days of the workshop. I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Tariq Khan, who invited me to deliver this inaugural lecture. Yes, it was a stop gap, uh, standing kind of situation when Ms. Mini Krishnan had to suddenly, you know, uh, attend to her, one of her uh, very uh, urgent uh, personal uh, 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 situations that uh, I stepped in. 
My greetings to Professor Annie Kuryachan, the principal of Women's Christian College, Chennai. Finally, my hello and cheers to my audience, most of whom I understand are the students at the Women's Christian College. Since this is a workshop meant primarily for students, I will try to share with them my experiences as a literary translator and as an editor of English translation. The narration of my experiences as a, as, as a translator will form the part two of this lecture. I have published English translations of literary texts from 24 national languages and from an equal number of or more of small languages and tribal languages from all over the country through Indian literature, the bi-monthly English Journal of Sahitya Academy or the National Academy of Letters of India for more than 20 years. Now I'll explain the caption of the lecture, which is, quote unquote, translating literary texts into English, the post-colonial Indian context. By literary translation, I mean the process that carries the culture of a literary text in one language, forming a text in another language in the process. The language from which translation is done is known as the original or the source language, and the language into which the text is translated is known as the target language. I'm aware that these are but elementary terms for those who are into translation studies already, but I'm mentioning them here nevertheless, assuming that among my listeners there could be novices also. The process of translation assimilates the nuances of the target language around the, same, in the sense to be translated by choosing from it the right shades of meanings of the words selected for conveying the equivalence of the original. This process often showcases the culture behind the original text and enriches the target language text and its culture in different ways. As far as I am concerned, the source language I am dealing with is Malayalam and the target language is English. And I translate literary texts from Malayalam into English. Though I have translated poetry and drama from Malayalam, my main area is fiction, both short stories and novels. By literary texts, I mean poetry, fiction, drama, literary criticism, biography and autobiography, children's writing, travelogue, folk literature, etc. I also include oral texts existing mostly among the tribal cultures of India. By English, I mean the Indian variety of the English language that has developed a distinct literature which would be two centuries old in 2025. Henry de Rossio, the first poet of this new literature, had published his first poems in several journals and newspapers in 1825. These poems echoed Indian national aspirations and resonated with the cultural heart tropes of our land. This literature is distinct from the language of the center of the erstwhile empire, King's or Queen's English, in that it would carry Indian cultural ethos as naturally as any other Indian language would do. The strong nationalist feelings that prevailed even after the struggle for independence was over tried to hold English back and put up a strong resistance against the prevalence of English, which was termed as the colonizer's language. This attitude slowly disappeared as new Indian writing in English began to grab world attention. Salman Rushdie winning the 1981 Booker Prize for his Midnight Children was a watershed moment. Then came the next Booker Prizes of Arun Sadi Roy, Kiran Deshai, and Arvind Daniga. At least by the end of the 20th century, Indian English as a literary language did not have to prove its Indianness to anyone. Still, there exists the paradox of the elite, especially of the Hindi belt, spurning English and at the same time cherishing it for their own education as well as their children, using it for upward mobility and yet making the appropriate noises, decrying it as the colonizer's language and rejecting it on occasions when they need to be politically correct. But like many of our multiple standard approaches, this too will hopefully get metamorphosed in the great millennial churning that is going on. All through the post-colonial period, Sahit Academy from its very inception in 1954 has been treating English as an Indian language, giving the authors its annual awards, translation prizes, etc., like any other Indian language. The Sahit Academy's first president, the then Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, had promoted its literature. He himself was a renowned author in, in this language. 
His successor as Sahitya Academy's president, Dr. S. Radhakrishnan too, was a great proponent of the English language. The path-breaking works of the first union law minister and the architect of our constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, have all been in English. In his capacity as a prime minister too, Jawaharlal Nehru had promoted English as one of the two official languages along with Hindi with a provision for it to fade away as the official language once Hindi permeated all over the Indian state's machinery. But that did not happen. And the tenure of English went on getting extended as the joint official language and the status quo continues. Besides the status of English as a linked language that facilitates translation from among the disparate national uh, international languages, keeps English entrenched on our national scene. I will be speaking today only about translations into English because I specialize in translating literary texts from Malayalam into English over the last 40 years. But I have been editing translations from all Indian languages into English, as I said, for more than 20 years for the journal Indian Literature. This journal is run using English translations, except in the cases where the literary works are in English, hence my specialization in this area. The wake of the culture spawned by this journal over more than half a century and through other factors of influence, Indian literature in English translation has become a stream for study in a few universities, including Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. I have also co-edited the best of Indian literature, the crown-sized 1,700 pages, four-volume book carrying the best of what we published in Indian literature over half a century from 1957 to 2007. The entries were once again edited by expert copy editors, which I oversaw meticulously, checked and passed for publication. Also in the year 2007, I conducted a national English translation competition to mark the golden jubilee of Indian literature, which brought this subject to wide attention. So much about English. By post-colonial context, I here mean the state of Indian English after the independence of India, after the British colonies, colonialists had left our country for good. But there were gray areas stretching before and after independence regarding English. Before independence, our nationalist leaders and literary icons who were also writers in English had never given an inch to the colonial dominance of the English language and culture. For example, I can cite the names of Sri Aurobindo, Rabindranath Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu, and others who used the English language to further the cause of nationalism and to present Indian culture in this language through their literary writings. Mulkraj Anand is a great literary icon in this language who was also an ardent nationalist. He wrote about the common people of India even before independence. R.K. Narayan and Raja Rao were two other great writers in Indian literature who stood out for their nationalism and pride in India's culture, who were established as successful writers before independence. Hence, they cannot be termed pre-colonial, though they established themselves as writers of English before independence, as their minds and intellects were never colonized. The second set was the opposite of the first, and these writers, few as they were, lived and taught in the hangover of the colonial preeminence of the English language even after independence, although they had lost their influence soon enough. Some left the country and settled in England or some other foreign country. Kamala Markandeya, uh, in, incidentally, she's from Mysore, she was a, she is a descendant of uh, uh, the Diwan Punaya, the legendary Diwan. And uh, Dom Mores and a few others belong to this category. Joe Morris, however, returned to India after two decades and settled down here and worked his way back to his Indianness. However, the hangover of British English in the academic field lingered on for a longer time, and Indian writing in English took an unbelievably long time to gain acceptance in the Indian academia. Only after the urge for decolonizing the mind, so to say, gained ground, did this extended colonial colonization of the language began, begin to be exhibit, uh, to begin to exhibit signs of fading away. There is still a strong presence of the classical English literature studies in Indian universities, from Beowulf to Virginia Woolf, as the saying goes, while in Western universities, literature studies have developed and branched out to culture studies and so on, 
keep the historical english literature merely as one of the disciplines in the larger ambit of literary studies professors design courses according to their preferences and specializations and decide credits and their courses are designed accommodating individual preferences of research breaking down the behemoth of the institutionalized department of english this trend has been catching up in our universities as well to turn to an example close by we have a department of cultural studies in the university of kerala headed by professor meena t pillai coming back to the topic literary translation in a post colonial context poses specific challenges in the first place the text in the target language should not be appropriated by the target language culture as its own this leaves the translator with the need to invent a form of expression replete with the cultural resonances of the source language for instance by leaving cultural traces of the original in the translated text a free translation makes it convenient for the target language readers to understand the work but they may do so on their own terms authorial authority could be useful here there is a need to interrogate these processes in relation to aspects of cultural politics however there are cases of the great pioneers of our national languages like eduthachan of malayalam sataladasa of odia or krithibasa oja of bengal who actually turned out to be the originators of their respective modern languages while they translated epics like the ramayana and the mahabharata condensing and even adapting the sanskrit originals in the process they were actually transcreators while we consider literary translation in the modern times we tend to ask what is the role of the translator should the translator be absolutely faithful to the source language text or can he or she take liberties like the above mentioned four base did and engage in transcreation however the authorial authority which gives the author complete ownership or seeming proprietorship of his or her works in this capitalistic modern times inherently demands fidelity to the original as against the medieval authors who engaged in literary creation for the benefit of the community many of them were not even aware of the possibility of carrying their bylines in the text because that was not in vogue some of them merely mentioned it in their stanzas as if a devotee was placing himself or herself at the holy feet of the deity we can see this happening in a different way in the modern gazal form as well in a modern context copyright has become like trademark unless it is with the full consent of the original author a text should not be adapted in literary translation or in film format only texts that are in the public domain free from the copyright claim that will be enforced for 60 years after the death of the original author can anyone freely adapt or transcreate from this injunction is more relevant in the case of dramatic texts which are adapted according to the vision of each theater director or film director however at the end of the day what are the concepts of fidelity to the, to the text that the translator should keep or the freedom that the translator can take are in there also a bunch of other considerations like questions of power involved in the choice of the target language how the target language text is prepared what readership is aimed at how the source language is manipulated especially if it enjoys lesser power how it may then be appropriated for the benefit of the target language group all these are serious questions to be raised also how the linguistic and cultural peculiarities of the source language culture that appear in the original text are to be negotiated the target language text ultimately decides the translatability of the text these concepts are all dealt with in detail by walter benjamin in his essay the task of the translator found in his essay collection titled illuminations any one of my listeners interested in further exploring this topic can look up this essay however i do not personally favor free translation or transcreation of a modern text i would always stick to fidelity in translation but this fidelity does not mean that one must follow the translator's use of words in the original literally in finding equivalent words in the target language text i insist on the translator using his or her own creative imagination in choosing the appropriate equivalences envisioning how the beauty of the original can be carried over into the translated text faithfulness consists in just doing that i however is sought to translating in neutral language certain peculiar texts 
texts in a part two are full of linguistic peculiarities and cultural expressions, for example. To avoid deleting them or explaining them away within the content, within the text, I need to adopt a neutral language. I found validation for this approach of mine in R. Anthony Lewis's essay titled "Language of Tran Language and Translation: Contesting Conventions." In the book title, "In Translation." Reflections, Refractions, Transformations, edited by Paul St. Pierre and Profila Sekar, printed in 2005 in New Delhi from Pencraft International, in which this stated, and I quote, translation scholars have to make the bold step of discarding the notions of source and target languages and view translation as a transformation of semantic content into unpredictably new but sometimes old forms within language. This conception would remove the ideological assumptions underlying questions such as language versus dialect, standard versus non-standard, which translation, which translation by leaning so heavily on conventional notions of language inadvertently maintains. Course close. I may offer to gloss a word or two within the text since Appended glossary, footnotes, or in notes will hamper the smoothness of reading. The choice of target language is an important factor in the post colonial context. Using the language of the center will put the context in the target language in a political frame that may be dislocated in historical terms, rather than if the translation is done in the language of the periphery or the language developed in the Israel colony. Hence, translation should not be done in Queen's English that does not accept or admit our local cultural expressions per se. We should use our variety of English, that is Indian English, which naturally accommodates the cultures that are carried in the various national literatures of India. The concept of the empire writing back comes to fruition in this scenario. Questions of power inherent in the process of translation have to be investigated. In the first place, the translator is, in a way, subverting authorial authority, especially in a free translation. What the original author accomplishes in the text in the source language is changed into something different than the text in the target language through the intervention of the target language and its culture. The translator is also the authority that decides what the reader of the text in the target language should read. It is possible that a translator may resort to suppression, partial elimination, or misrepresentation of elements or aspects of text in the source language, as will be revealed in a few examples later in this lecture. Attempts on the part of the original author to get to the reader of the text in target language, as illustrated in several of Milan Kundera's introductions to the translations of his work, would take us to the questions of maintaining authenticity and authorial authority of the text in the target language. The question of authors translating their own works comes in here too. Whether it is right for the author to translate, author translated to alter his or her original text in translation has been posed by scholars of translation studies. The, author, the authority of the author of the original extending the translated text is somewhat new territory. However, Serious thematic changes happening while alterations are made in the translated text have been called out. The pioneering modernist fiction writer O.V. Vijayan's translation of his first novel, Kasak Nidhi Hasan, that created history in modern Malayalam literature for his invention of his own fictional language and landscape for the novel, is a case in point. He translated the novel and titled it The Legends of Kasak, which departs from the original. It would have actually been the epic of Kasak or the saga of Kasak. Another point of censure in his depiction is his depiction in the translated text of the Muslim community called Rauthas as merely Muslims, and also the Irava community plainly as Hindus, which right away created an uncalled for binary in our troubled times, as pointed out by Professor P. P. Ravidran in one of his essays. Just because the author does it, doesn't absolve him of this aberration. You know, if, if a translator, if a translator, a translator from outside doing it, we'll call him out for his uh, laughs. But the, the editor, the, the, the author himself being translated does this, also the same problem uh, arises there. Inaccuracy, 
departed from the text and bringing in external elements and implications. The other noted translators of one's own work in Malayalam are Ayyappa Panikar and K. Sachidanandan, among important poets, and among noted fiction writers, Paul Zakaria and N.S. Madhavan. Thus, there are three main aspects of literary translation. If we consider literary translation into English from our national, other national languages of our country. Number one, linguistic and cultural problems. Number two, the problem of appropriation or how literature in our language languages is translated into English, shading it off its linguistic and cultural peculiarities and made available to the target language readers who are global in our present scenario, grabbing in the process the essential storyline and salient features of the original text and leaving out the inconvenient but unique features of a particular language. This will happen as a solution to the linguistic and cultural problems faced by the original text that will be prompted by various forces, including the market. There are also questions of power exercised by the translator and also by the target language, which is in our present case English. First, we will examine the linguistic and cultural problems and appropriation to the process of deletion, suppression, and omission. I'll cite a few examples to support my argument. The text I am going to examine here is as an illustration for linguistic and cultural problems encountered and how appropriation to suit the target language audience is affected is a great Malayalam novelist, Takadi Shivashankarapalli's renowned novel, Chemin, based on which the first color feature film in Malayalam was made by Ramu Kariyat and which won the President's gold medal. We can Narayana Menon, the illustrious Sanskrit scholar and revered musicologist who translated the novel for a UNESCO project which was intended to take third world literature to the first world readers has deleted more than 30 percent of the text as was discovered when I compared the original text with the translation. Wherever the novel went lyrical and in a typically localized sentimental vein, the translator had deleted it. The peculiarities of the local patwa of the fisher folk of the Alapura coastal region the cultural signs and modes represented in the novel were all done away with, retaining only the romantic, tragic storyline. The method adopted was to mark up and delete entire paragraphs or passages which were difficult to communicate to a foreign readership. I made inquiries with a close associate of Narayana Menon from those times and was told to my dismay that Tagadi himself had sat with the translator to edit out the local elements. This was done obviously at the instance of some international editor to cater to international or first world tastes. For this, the so-called sentimental muck had to be removed. Of course, in 1963, when it was done, translation studies had not developed into a separate branch, but Walter Benjamin and other great scholars had already developed so much of canon in this discipline. There is another case in point, again involving Tagadi Shivashankarapule. There is a recent news story that came out in September 2021 edition of the e-paper Mosiris.post.in, in which one professor G. Balachandran reminisced about how N. Srikanth Nair, the lion of the Revolutionary Socialist Party, or RSP, former member of parliament and a close friend of Tagadi Shivachandra Pillai of long standing, insisted on translating Tagadi's masterwork, Kair, and did it, taking the freedom of the friendship he enjoyed with Tagadi and ended up with a poorly translated text. Takadi had revealed that he had based one of the lead characters of the novel, Surendran, on Srikandan Nair. Srikandan Nair, who was a first rank holder in a university master's exam in English, did the translation as he pleased. However, he passed away without having the work published. His widow, Mahesh Riyama, approached Takadi for permission to publish the work. Takari read through the text and did not approve of the quality of the translation because the linguistic and cultural nuances of the original were missing from it. He refused to grant permission. Maheshwari Amma requested Professor Balachandran to intercede on her behalf, which he did. But Takari told him about the inadequacy of the translated text and stood firm that he would not approve the manuscript for publication. When he didn't relent, Maheshwari Amma took the drastic step of releasing an advertisement in the newspapers stating that she was going to build a funeral pyre in some public place and cremate 
the manuscript because Tagadi was not granting permission to publish it. Finally, Tagadi granted his permission and took the initiative to send it to the Central Science Academy for publication. I have seen appropriation and free translation, even adding of extra material to the translation from the outside, the original happening in other languages as well. Most importantly, in Kannada and Telugu. Even you are Anandamurthy's iconic novel, Avaste, in his close friend, Shantinath Desai's translation, published in 1990 by Karutman Publications, is missing out on the lyrical language full of associations and connotations. And the translator had added elaborate sections of his own, taking off from certain tangential points in the novel. I've had the occasion to compare this translation with the faithful Malayalam translation of Avaste by the acclaimed translator, C. Raghavan, I noted down all these points in minutest detail that Ananda Murthy had requested me to thoroughly revise the translation. I had done translations of these deleted portions as I had de detected from the Malayalam version and proposed to revise, the, uh, revise and edit Shantina Desai's version, making the novel faithful to the original as far as I could reckon through the comparison with the Malayalam version. However, Ananda Murthy sadly passed away without taking any final decision in the matter. In Telugu, the English translation of the celebrated fiction writer Kola Kaluri Inok's magnum opus, Awakened Soil, published by Sanborn Publications Delhi, suffered a similar fate at the hands of someone close to him. The language was inadequate, daringly literal, erasing the lyrical quality of the original. Finally, the entire text had to be thoroughly copied it. Once again, personal connection and intimacy between the author and the translator played spoiled spot in ensuring the quality of the English translation. Before the 1980s, most of the translations, at least from Malayalam to English, except for a very few, were done condescendingly, inaccurately, and unfaithfully, taking liberties with the original at the whim of the translator, with scant respect for the intrinsic literary value of the original. The hegemonic role that the English language enjoyed during the colonial and early post-colonial eras in Kerala made the English translator some sort of a potentate. Many writers were somewhat beholden to such translators. This sort of seeking after English translations, despite their poor quality, prevailed till the time the Malayalam English translation boom began on baby steps after the early 1980s, precisely after Salman Rushdie's winning the Booker Prize in 1981, as already seen, for midnight children that brought in a spate of competent Indian English writing and publishing. This had inspired English translations to come out from Penguin India and other MNC publishing houses that came up soon enough. These celebrated publishing houses, including academic publishers like Magdalen India, OUP, and others, would insist on competent translations. Thus, professional copy editing came to be adopted, raising the quality level of the English used in However, this trend promoted the induction of a special breed of copy editors who paid scant attention to the linguistic and cultural nuances of the original and planed out the details and rendered the translation plain and easy to read in English, much like what happened to Chimin in Narayana Menon's translation. These editors were, in most of the cases, greenhorns, fresh after their English MA from reputed colleges or universities and probably did not have first-hand acquaintance, first acquaintance with the rural cultural ethos in the various corners of the country. Thus, the copy editors were not, in many cases, sensitive or sensitized about their linguistic and cultural peculiarities. They, were also, they would also have been working against type deadlines. Therefore, cases in which the translator would accept the editor's choices unquestioningly in her or his anxiety to have the book published, or where the original author was briskly unaware of what was happening to his or her text at the hands of the editor, the final translated text coming out published would have suffered appropriation at the basic level. Miss Mini Krishnan, whom I may describe as a one-woman army who single-handedly brought out, first from Macmillan, India, and then from OUP, literary translations from Indian languages over the last four decades, is a great pioneer in the field who corrected this trend through her own dedication. Mini Krishnan goes to any lengths to get the linguistic and cultural nuances in a creative text in the original, reflected accurately in the translated text while finalizing it.
The pain that she takes in this regard yields excellent results in that the translation she publishes are deemed as the most faithful ones. An interviewer once asked Mini Krishnan in 2019, this is a question, what is your definition of a good translation? What are the qualities it must have? Her reply was, and I quote, this is something I have been trying to figure out for 30 years. Sometimes a smooth read will fail to capture the imagination of the reader. Sometimes even a translator is jerky. Even if a translation is jerky and appears to be rushing along, it will work. I think it is a combination of inspiration and zeal on the part of the translator and very patient work on the part of the editor. The qualities, the language must bring the author alive. It must make you think. If XY had written in English instead of in Marathi, this is how he must have phrased it. Now, it is all very well to say this to ourselves, but to someone who is not Indian, this might still not work at all. Basically, I think we should be translating first for our Indian market before trying to reach spaces and minds outside India. Here, I have to say mea culpa in many cases. I'm also ready to accept my responsibilities here for one-sidedly editing translations received for publication in Indian literature by monthly English journal I edited for 20 years. In my defense, I can only say that most of the submissions I received were unsolicited, and checking translations against the original was not feasible, as mine was a periodical and bound by its periodicity of two months. Only in the case of translation workshops organized to generate material for Indian literature could we ensure such checking with the original. Also, in the cases in which I had commissioned special issues of Indian literature carrying various focus sections, the editors and compilers I engaged, for example, for the 21st century Indian poetry series, I carried in Indian literature for, from nine national literatures over a period of four years always checked the translations against the originals. So this is a necessary lapse I had to, uh, I have to admit before you. But the, the best we can do is this in such a very complex situation. The status a competent translator in the West enjoys is on par with the original author as illustrated by Garcia Marquez terming Gregory Rabasa's translation as even better than his original. Rabasa had translated Gabo's four iconic titles, 100 Years of Solitude, the Autumn of the Patriarch, Chronicle of Death Foretold, and Leaf Storm, and earned for himself and the original author millions of readers and all around the globe and several millions of dollars. On the other hand, in our country, the translator in many cases is almost like a boarded laborer a gulam, sometimes not even able to use bylines. What the translator gets, even from respectable publishing houses, is a pittance going by the royalty percentages on the Indian rates of the book. Therefore, choosing literary translation as a profession in present-day India is far from realistic. Most of the literary translators are doing translation as their personal passion or as a serious hobby that makes their lives more meaningful. There are any number of professionals and civil servants who turn to creative writing and literary translation this way. The senior IAS officer in the UPK term is Minish T.S., whose translation of V.J. James' Malayalam novel, Anticlock, which is in the shortlist of the JCB Prize currently, is just one example. Many civil servants from Odisha, Bengal, Maharashtra, and the Hindi-speaking world, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, and Malayalam are found among renowned authors and translators. We do have many more competent translators of fiction from Malayalam to English. J. Sri Kalathil, who won both the JCB Prize and the Crossword Award in 2020. J. Deviga, E. V. Fatima, K. Nandakumar, and a few others who are noted because they are in the shortlist of prestigious awards. J. Deviga's translation of the selected short stories of Unni R title One Hell of a Lover is noted for creative liberties taken with the language bordering on transcreation, which I found aesthetically pleasing. My translation of Paul Zakaria's short stories into collections, M. Mukundan's novel Keshavan Devilabangal as Keshavan's Lamentations, which won me the crossword award, 
and perumbravam sridharan suru sankirtanam pole uh, like a psalm are all creatively and imaginatively faithful i ma- i make this distinction as against being literally faithful ev fatima and k nanda kumar as a team translated m mukundan's novel delhi kathakal as delhi a soliloquy in a recent conversation the daipur literary festival invited me to host i had occasion to speak to both the translators and the original author in the virtual space i was pleasantly surprised by the strategies they followed while fatima was unfamiliar with the patwa of north malabar no uh, sorry while fatima was familiar with the patwa of north malabar which was confined largely to a certain community nanda kumar through consultations with her caught up however when she proposed editing out certain portions which she thought was not relevant in the english translation nanda kumar chipped in and insisted that trans- they translate the entire text and leave it to the editors to make a final call all this worked to the great success of the novel which is now in the shortlist of the jcb prize there is a more important role for translators and translations in our country especially over the last three decades i refer to how the power of the dominant language english has valorized marginalized groups like dalits women differently gendered people and marginalized groups like lgbtqia+ and 2s so for uh, those of you who do not follow such data i will expand the acronym lgbtqia+ and 2s as lesbian gay bisexual transgender queer or questioning intersex asexual or ally and now 2s has been added to represent two spirited which is used by indigenous people to describe the sexuality or gender and the plus sign at the end encompasses inclusivity there are also environmental activists and other others among these marginalized groups translations of dalit and autobiographies like lakshman greekwards poison bread sharan kumar limbale sakramasi dalit brahmin etc namdevo dhatal's masterpieces done into english by philip spray are just a few examples of how it all began publishing houses for such specialized publications came up strengthening the role of english translation of works by marginalized groups kali for women the publishing house established by urvashi botalia and ritu menon in 1984 for exclusive publication of women's writing is the oldest of them all in 2003 botalia and menon parted ways urvashi set up zuban and ritu started women unlimited both houses are going strong still publishing houses like navayana in chennai founded in 2003 by s anand catering to dalit writing is another important one many krishnan whose noted contributions include comprehensive dalit literature anthology of tamil english and malayalam english stresses the choice and coordination of the right kind of translators and editors the oup dalit anthologies of which many krishna was the general editor where the oxford india anthology of malayalam dalit writing edited by m dasan and the oxford india anthology of tamil writing edited by d ravi kumar and r alagarasan there were other editors as well who made valuable contributions in this regard the dossier one of south indian dalit writing title no alphabets in sight new dalit writing from south india malayalam and tamil and the second dossier named from those stubs steel nips are sprouting dalit writing from south india kannada and telugu compiled and edited by suti taru and k satinarayana are indeed important this uh, takes us to the close of the first part The second part is a narration of my experiences as a translator. As a second part of the lecture I will narrate my personal story as a translator in the hope that it will inspire would be translators. I began with translating poetry out of an extreme necessity. It was 1979 and I was working with the Kerala Tourism Development Corporation Arunachal Pradesh at Tekadi Imperial Tiger Reserve. in the high ranges of the district which is now in news all over uh, the south uh, national level because of the malaria town a lot of foreign tourists from all parts of the globe used to visit 
my career stay there once a lady teacher from australia arrived she was very much interested in literature when she learned that i was a poet she wanted to read my poems since i wrote in english she could read and enjoy them but she asked me what our mother tongue was i said it was malayalam then she asked me why i did not write poetry in my in my language I explained to her that i studied in bandel in west bengal for 2 years I had no way of reading my language when speaking in our language in our lady's house high secondary school where we studied was prohibited then i started writing in english and poetry came naturally to me she expressed a desire to taste malayalam poetry and requested me to translate a poem i obliged her and translated a poem titled adam and god by one of the leading poets of malayalam vishnu narayanan nambudiri it was in standard language with a mix of sanskrit based words therefore translation was not difficult it came out well in fact though it was my first attempt she had to leave in a few days and she burdened me with the laborious task of collecting representative poetry from all indian languages and to send them to her this was really daunting you know this is uh, the in 1979 Uh, those who are born uh, in, in in the after the millennium uh, living now the youngsters would not even be able to imagine you know there was no internet nothing as the days and weeks wore by she began to send me long handwritten letters reminding me of my poems in those days there was no internet or email much less any cell phone i translated more poems from malayalam and tried to collect poetry from other languages in those days literary translation into english was rare except for poetry translations published in the illustrated weekly of india whose poetry editor was kamala das then only the mirror caravan etc carried occasional poetry translations i collected whatever i could and sent her this was my first brush with translation as i began to become acquainted with the leading malayalam poets of the day like k i f panikkar Sogda Gumari, Kadamani, Ramakrishna, K. Sachidanand, and Devanay Chandran, Balsan, and Chulikar, Vijay Lakshmi, and others, and began translating their poems on request. I began to grapple with the poetic language of speech. None of them were writing in standard Malayalam. Kadamani, Ramakrishna, and Vijay Chandran were writing many of their poems in deeply idiomatic Malayalam peculiar to the southern districts of Kerala, the flavors of which would be totally lost in translation. Ayyappa Panikkar was using peculiar Malayalam words, sometimes in combination with English words, to produce effects of pun and metonymy, which in translation would fall flat. I had to play it safe here, refusing to translate the so-called and translatable poems, and choosing only poems in standard language. So, Kudu Kumari, Sachidanand, and Balajan, and Chulikar, and Vijay Lakshmi were using metrical Malayalam words to create me at the time, but I was tempted to translate some of their poems in corresponding metrical composition in English. and as some words succeeded in some cases it was 1987 by now and i had been introduced to the eminent poet lyricist and socio political cultural activist of yesterday years poet vikrup who later won the jagdeep award he did not have a credible english translation of his poems at that time one this of his poems translated occasionally by several people who were compiled together and he requested me to take a look at them edit them and make a book A great part of these translations, especially of his great odes, were below par, and I told him so. He requested me to translate and replace all the poems I deemed weak in translation, and I agreed. But days and months were passing, and I was busy and unable to spare any time, as I had joined the School of Letters of the Mahatma Gandhi University Kottayam in its first ever batch of MPhil students. As time passed, Oynvi was now resigned to the fate of the book. but soon he had come out with his masterpiece the words novel titled ujjayini based on the life and works of kalidasa and he wanted me to translate it and introduce it to a pan indian audience i took it as a challenge and completed it in a year i had to grapple with oynvi's language which was full of mellifluous words which when translated into english would sometimes bring in a sense of redundancy secondly what was music to the ear in malayalam would all be lost in translation his poetry was full of magically beautiful words culled from the local tongues folk songs and country phrases i told him that my translation will come out in standard language and all his embellishments and lyrics would be lost he smiled and told me that i was at full liberty to recompose his poetry in english as he was convinced that his poetry was not merely sound and fury 
and the remaining essence will be weighty enough. I was astonished. A poet known for his petulance and finicky nature when it came to the treatment of his words was giving me unlimited freedom. I was owed by the weight of the trust he best bestowed on me and of the responsibility that came with it. In all the sessions we had together, revising my translation against his original was very astute in pointing out errors or departures from the original, which he had marked on a pre-sent draft. He was a master of English as well, and his corrections were very valid. However, I was never intimidated by his preeminence as a poet, which would naturally have hindered productive work. He sensed it at the very beginning and granted me a high degree of ease with him, which gave me immense confidence. Ujjaini came out excellently from Rupa and Company years later in its second imprint. The first imprint was by a little known publisher who passed away suddenly and the book could not be salvaged. The success of this book immediately inspired ONV to remind me to resume work on the anthology left behind. I plunged into work again and edited the available poems. Then I translated almost one half of the poems now found in the book titled The Sentient Liar, which I compiled and edited, and the Scythe Academy published. Another book of poems by ONV, which I translated, is The End of the Day, published by DC Books, Cotteum. It was towards the end of his life. In all these, I found ONV to be the gentlest, most encouraging, and perceptive original author who was never a nerve-wracking presence who prevailed upon the translator. Going back to the early 1990s again, Anwar Ali, my batchmate for Impil, was a young, promising poet at the time, and we were thick friends. He is the leading poet of his generation. Anwar wanted me to translate his poems, which were creations in the aftermodern style of nuanced visual words and full of allusions to the ancient texts and the works of his composer. The poetic language was very tight, chiseled, and polished. It was a challenging task translating them, but he was my friend. There was no question of refusing him. I worked very hard on the lines, revised and polished them. Even then, he was not satisfied querying about the slightest shades as he was not as good in English then as he is now. Altogether, it was my first experience of the original poet interfering in my translation, and I learned to be as precise as I could be. Trans creation, as the revered P. Lal and his followers named free translation, was a never heard of thing in all my translation endeavors hereafter. I too got to see the point. There was very little space for freedom in the poem or story or novel, which was so tightly made. Anita Tambi, a friend of Anwar and myself, and the leading poetic voice, was another such poet who engaged in very compact and polished poetic compositions. With her also, I had a similar experience. Many other poets of the younger generations I translated, like S. Joseph, P. P. Ramachandran, and a whole lot of others to pose similar questions. And I evolved with the times, its demands, and the growth of Malayalam poetry. Back again to the early 1990s to trace my translation of fiction. Of fiction. The Enfield dissertation I chose was actual translation of 17 contemporary Malayalam short stories with a long introductory study, as suggested by my first supervising teacher, the legendary literary critic, theater director, and film actor, Professor R. Narendra Prasad and followed by Dr. V.C. Harris, the formidable exponent of modern literary theory and a translator of eminence. Reading Dr. Harris's manuscript of the translated stories of Kamala Das titles, Sandal Trees and Other Stories, subsequently published by Disha Books Hyderabad, gave me the confidence to attempt translating short stories. This led me to choose the 17 stories by eminent and upcoming story writers at the time. The translation was done over a period of three months, working at least 12 hours a day. The writing of the study of about 120 pages took me a longer time, but it gave me an opportunity to inquire into the theory and practice of translation in a serious way. All of these stories, Anama Teacher, a memoir by Paul Shakaria, Love by Sarah Joseph, Twelfth Hour by V.P. Shivakumar, and The Wondrous Riddle by Thomas Joseph stand out. In fact, the wondrous riddle, Thomas Joseph's masterwork till then, was the most challenging. Its language was full of metaphors, and it was, in effect, a long phantasmagoria. 
holding on to its intrinsic aesthetic unity through faithful translation was a real challenge. My empty dissertation, 17 contemporary Malayalam short stories, translation with an introductory study, secured me a first class in the MPhil exam. Next came my real break. It was an assignment to translate Paul Zakaria's short stories for the Associated East West Publishing House. There was Gita Krishnan Guti to share the stories to be translated. Chakraya and I were very close friends by now, uh, but my translation underwent his severe scrutiny as he was himself an accomplished writer and editor in English. Exacting work, comparing translations word for word with the original, it was hard discipline. Thus came out Bhaskara Pateler and other stories in 1992 from the Imbrid Manas of the Associated East West Chennai. I learned a lot in the process and began to earn name and fame. The book was reviewed in the Times Literary Supplement, an honor any author or translator would be proud of. Translating one of the stories by Shakaria, titled Salam America, written in the Patwa, spoken around the Kuravalangad Kadaturita region of Kerala, which could never find equivalence in the ragged language English, was an unforgettable experience. I did it straight in neutral language, and the story stood its ground because of its pithy narrative content, as validated in our Anthony Lewis's essay, Language and Translation, Contesting Convention, which I have already cited in the beginning. This story won me the Qatar Prize for translation. In the meanwhile, in 1996, I won an International Literary Translation Prize, the AKMG Prize for translating Sethu's short story, Do the or the mission. This prize enabled me to tour USA, UK, and Europe for four months in 1997. The organizers of the prize ensured that in the USA I would participate in the international writing program at Writers Center Bethesda, Maryland, and would take part in the annual conference of American Writers Federation in Washington, D.C. I was able to tour the important centers in USA, UK, and Europe related to literature and culture. By the second collection of Sakarya's short stories published by Penguin in 1998, I had become good at it. The collection was titled The Reflections of a Hen in Her Last Hour and Other Stories, which drew one much critical acclaim. I had been translating K. Sachidananda's poems from as early as 1986, and after joining Sahitya Academy in the editorial department of Indian Literature in 1997, I continued translating his poems. They are included in three of his early collections in English translation. I also translated the celebrated plays of Professor Om Cheri in and play, including The Deluge, which Rupa and Company published about this time. I had finished my PhD by this time under the supervision of Professor V.C. Harris, who sadly left us on October 9, 2017, in a freak accident. The thesis was titled Modern Malayalam Fiction and English, an inquiry into the cultural and linguistic problems of translation. This research equipped me with the important modern theories of translation to be applied in practice. By now, I was looking at translating a novel, Keshavan's Lamentations, again that of a friend, M. Mukundan, the celebrated Malayalam novelist. This book posed a big challenge. The conversations were in the dialect of North Malabar, with direct with references to culture-specific terms. I had to negotiate it by myself as no equivalence would be possible. Once again, I had to employ neutral language as already described. It was a labor of love over two years with repeated sessions with the author and the then Ruba editor K.S. Bijukumar and his editor wife Abhirami Sriram, both of whom are residents of Chennai now. Abhirami is an editor with Friendline. They had given me invaluable assistance in finalizing the translated text. The result was even more spectacular. It won the Crossword Award for translation in 2007. By now, I had started work on another great work in Malayalam, the novel Uru Sankirtanam Pole, or Like a Sam, the martial work by Perimbadavam Sridharan, a prolific novelist in Malayalam. The novel was based on the life of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Over the last 28 years of its publication, through more than 4 lakhs copies over 120 editions, it has broken all records in Kerala's publishing history. Therefore, it was again a grim task ahead of me to render into English Sridharan's magical words that would satisfy his admirers worldwide who would be vigilantly watching out for any flow. It took me nearly three years to complete it. 
over many revisions and fine tuning. Through a strange irony in publishing history, the book that attracted so much interest in its original so as to create a fresh publishing record in all genres in Malayalam, this translation was not picked up by any major publisher over the next 15 years. Incidentally, this is uh, the translation I cherish most as my best. It is on Goodreads. You can Google and see on it's, it's been on Goodreads. Finally, when it did come out of Leafy Books in an excellent production, it attracted good reviews and serious interviews with the translator. My journey as a translator has taken me along historic poems like the Kandagavya Karuna by Komar Nasan published in 1921, which by the way remains incomplete. Uluras Paramishraya's poem on the atom bomb in which, which was uh, written in 1945, right after the explosion of the first atomic bomb, besides the already mentioned eminent poets whom I have translated. From among the often modern generation that got established since the mid-1980s, whom I have already mentioned, I've also translated Savitri Rajivan, N.G. Unikrishnan, V.M. Girija, T.P. Rajivan, Fayar Tony, and others who got themselves established in the 1990s. Of the latest crop of film millennials, I have translated the poetry of Kudur Wilson, Sindhu K.V., N.P. Sandhya, K.M. Pramod, Sukumaran Chaligada, P. Shivalingan, Shanti Panagan. All these three are uh, tribal poets from uh, Wainar. Ashokan Marayur, again a tribal poet from uh, Marayur. P. Anil Kumar is a uh, Fisher, Fisher folk community, uh, someone writing in uh, the Pato of the Fisher folk. These are excellent poets. Then there are Asim Tanimud, Adil Madatil, Ajish Dasan, Kartik Patambi, P. A. Nazim Uzin, and several others. Currently, I have completed a project commissioned by LF Book Company in their Greatest Stories Ever Told series. The book is provisionally titled The Greatest Malayalam Short Stories Ever Told for which I have selected, compiled, and translated stories by 75 leading writers over the last 100 years with an extensive introductory study. This is all for today. Thank you.